And we've been spending uh, the last several weeks with Jordan Maxwell during this hour, and we're going to get to something tonight that he's wanted to talk about for quite some time. Hello, Jordan. How are you? Well, fine, Jeff. I'm happy to be back here with you again. Good. Okay. Um, so what's on the what's on the agenda? You we got a subject here that's going to be very interesting. Yeah. Well, you know what we talked uh, we talked for a few moments about uh, my experience with uh, uh, with helping David Ike. I think I'm going to put that off till next week. I got a few other things I want to talk about this sure, week. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, when I was uh, a teenager, I was always very self, uh, 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 self. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Self-conscious of uh, my my ears protruded off of my head more than I would 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 you know care to have, and I was always kind of self-conscious of that. I that was before ears. Uh, before super glue came around. I remember. Yeah, that's before super glue, and uh, <laughs> and so I always uh, you know I always wanted to have an operation on my ears to pin them back. And so uh, when I got married, I was about 26 years old, and I was out of work, a typical kid, 26-year-old, just got married and out of work. And and so I was driving through Beverly Hills uh, because it was supposedly a job I was going to go look look at. And uh, as I was driving through Beverly Hills that day, uh, there was a high-rise uh, right at this main cross-section in Beverly Hills, big, big streets. And um, on the top of the high rise is big sign saying uh, a plastic surgeon. And I thought, that's what I want. I want a plastic surgeon. <laughs> so I parked my car and went up and got in the elevator and went up to the top floor. And uh, it was a very, very plush and big office. And uh, and so I went in and I told the uh, the, uh, the the girl there that uh, I wanted to talk to the doctor. Uh, and, and she said, well, he is not here. He's uh, at UCLA. He teaches uh, plastic surgery. To, he, you know, he's a teacher uh, uh, of uh, plastic surgery. And he's uh, out at UCLA. He has his office out there. And so I said, well, I, I need to talk to a doctor. And so she said, well, I've got one here. So she called this other doctor. And he came out, and I told him what I wanted. And so... He took some measurements on my ear and looked uh, looked at it, and, and he said, "Well, that's no problem. I think we could do that." And so he said, "And uh, and so he said, I would. I think it's probably going to be about ten thousand uh, with the uh, hospital and everything. It'll probably be about ten thousand, a little over." And I said to him, "I said, Doctor, I am broke. I have no job. I have no money. I have nothing. I'm, I'm totally, uh, you know, got nothing. Zero." And so he said to me, well, then why are you here? And I said, well, I think it's pretty obvious why I'm here. I need my ears worked on. And he mm-hmm. said, yeah, but how are you going to do that with no money? I said, oh, I'll show you. I'll show you. I said, uh, <laughs> where is the where is the boss of this place? <laughs> and he said, the doctor who owns this business is at UCLA. He's in charge of plastic surgery a clinic at UCLA. This is uh-huh. many years ago, uh-huh. and so and so he said, and he's very very busy. I, I'll take. I, I can answer your questions. I said I don't need you to answer any questions. What I need is to talk to the doctor. And he said, Well, you know, if you don't have any money, it's a waste of time. I said, How do you know that? You don't know that. And and so the secretary is sitting listening to us, and I told the doctor, I said, look, all I want to do is just talk to the doctor. And and so uh, the secretary said, well, he's awful busy. I said, I didn't ask you if he was busy. I said, I want to talk to him. And so I knew I wasn't getting anywhere with them. So I said, look, I don't want to cause a scene. I don't want to be unkind, but I'm not leaving here, and I'm going to make a scene if I don't talk to the doctor. So get him on the phone, and I need to talk to him. <laughs> and so they, the doctor shrugged his shoulders and said, okay, call him. What are you going to do? So call. So she got on the phone, and she calls UCLA, and she gets the boss on the phone. And, and so I, she says, I have a guy here that needs to have his ears worked on. And, uh, and, and her, her face lit up because the doctor told her, 
uh, he was getting ready the following week. He was getting ready to do a whole new class on, on uh, plastic surgery at UCLA. And there were doctors <laughs> coming from all over the world to, uh, to learn the newest techniques. And he was the best and he was the master. And so he said, uh, he told her, put me on. So I got on the phone with him and he says, uh, he said, you, you need ears worked on? I said, yes, sir, I do. And he said, I need you. I've got everybody lined up for, <laughs> you know, to, to, you know, to use, uh, to show uh -huh. the other doctors, but I don't have anybody, can't find anybody in Los Angeles who needs ears worked on. And I said, well, you're talking to him right now. <laughs> they so don't call said, me oh. Dumbo for nothing, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Right. And so he said, well, all right. He said, I, uh, all right, you will be my patient on the, on the, on the, uh, on the ears. And so he said, and, and give me back to the, uh, secretary and I'll That's tell her. Funny. And so, and so I said, uh, and so he, then he said to me, he said, I'm going to do this operation because I'm using you. Uh, I'm, I'll do it for one third of what it normally costs. And I said, no, doctor, no, you're not going to do it for one-third. You're going to do it for free. I don't have a dime. I'm broke, got nothing, no job, nothing. And I said, and not, not only that, but I'm going to need hospitalization and, and other care after the operation, and you'll have to do that for free because I don't have anything. And he waited for a few moments, and he said, all right, put the, put the secretary on the phone. And he told her, you know, get him, uh, you know, get him connected to the hospital and get him there now, uh, and I'll take care of everything. It's going to be my expense. So I ended up going to, uh, uh, to uh, Cedars Sinai and uh, having an operation uh, like I wanted, and the doctor paid for everything, my hospitalization, my, uh, you know, all the, the, the other visits I had to go back to a three Sure, follow-ups, yeah. Of course, and and so uh, and and, I was, and he was amazed, and I was too. But uh, I got what I wanted. I went in there. I said I want to talk to the doctor. I did, and I got what I needed. Another and it didn't cost me a nickel. Another cosmic Maxwellian encounter. <laughs> I mean, it was a silly kind of thing, but it, it you know it. it, it That's Jordan. It, it, no, no, I it, got just it. strange things happen around me, and so. And then I was thinking about a couple of other things. You know, when I, when I first got married, my wife had some a lady friend, an older couple, and and, and uh, she wanted to go visit them one night. And so we we drove over to this old couple's home, and uh, the old lady was uh, she, they were a very nice couple. And and so my wife, when we got there, went into the kitchen with the old lady, and they were talking. And the husband wanted me to go see his ham operation. He had an enormous operation in his den of his home with all the you know, all the equipment for uh, for radio and sure. uh, and ham ham yeah. operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just fascinated listening to him talking to people all over the world. All over the world. And, that is yeah. a, that's an amazing ham Incredible. radio. Incredible. He was yeah. talking to people at the Vatican and uh, and on the ships at sea. Uh, and so I spent about a half an hour just sitting there listening to him and listening, watching him do uh, what he's doing with the with the radio stuff. And then uh, I I decided to get up and wander around the house for a few minutes. And I went up into the front room. And the front room, he had been a merchant a sailor. He had been a merchant seaman, and he had been all over the world. Uh, and and because of that, he had been collecting all kinds of artifacts from all over the world. He had uh -huh, from uh -huh. Africa, little statues and trinkets and all, you know, just all kinds of interesting little strange stuff that he's picked up in his life as a merchant marine. And But there was one thing in that front room that was overbearing. It, just, it, it was enormously important. It was a statue about five and a half to six foot high of a dragon. And it was candy apple red, and I do mean flashy candy wow. apple red. That's pretty weird. Uh, and it was a beautifully carved uh, dragon, and it was like a big pillar uh, sitting on on the leaves and and, and branches 
all of that was hand carved the leaves the branches and then the big pillar and this and this dragon was wrapped around it and uh and it was an extraordinarily beautiful thing like i said about five and a half six foot tall mm -hmm. and it was looking the, the the dragon was looking at the other side of the room uh, uh at the other corner of the room, and there was a window over there, so it looked like uh, he was set up, so he's looking out the window. Mm -hmm. And so I walked up to this this statue um, and was looking at the at the uh, uh, you know at the art work of of the base with all the leaves and and grass and everything. It was all wooden carved. And so I was looking at the base, uh, you know, admiring the beauty of the of the handwork. And as I started, my eyes began to rise up, and and you know, slowly but surely, uh, seeing every little detail as a, as I was raising my eyes up higher and higher to. And when I finally looked up at it, it was looking at me. It was looking directly at me, and it, my heart dropped into my stomach. I thought I was going to faint. I, I could not believe. Did you say because, anything? That's no, that, no. It just it, it, that it, leave I you just, speechless. Wow. No, it was totally speechless. But but when I walked in, it was looking, uh, it's a wooden statue, and it's it's uh, it's looking over to the other side of the room. Got it. And when I'm standing there looking at the base, and then as I as I continue to raise my eyes higher and higher, mm -hmm. looking at this thing, when I saw the <laughs> face, it's looking at me, and I, uh. I I felt the adrenaline go through my body. I felt uh, the fear just went all through my body, and I was I was shaking. And I left out of the front room, uh -huh. and I went back to the kitchen. And I told my wife, I said. We have to go now. And she says, and she said, okay, in a few moments. And I said, no, I said, now. That's N-O-W. Immediately. We have to go. And so she didn't like it. And I said, I don't care if you don't like it. We have to go. So she, she came with me, and we got in the car, and we left. I was shaking. And, uh, and, but I can't imagine why. Her. Wow. <laughs> and I never told her what I had seen and what happened to me because... You know, I, I I had already problems with my wife trying to adjust mm -hmm. to the kind of life I live. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to tell her that because it would really freak her out. And so, you now <laughs> that's just one more strange thing that scared me to death. That's and, a good uh, one. That, that's uh, wild. Did you ever go back? No, no. I would never go back to that place ever again. I mm -hmm. just thought, I don't know what that was. I don't know who was playing tricks on me. But any time a wooden statue turns around and looks directly at me, yeah, I'm never yeah. going back, ever. So, well, it's like one of those stories. Uh, hey, look what I got at the garage sale. And the thing has yeah. a mind of its own. Exactly. Wild. That's, that's Wild. exactly what it was. You know, people say, look at this beautiful statue I bought in China. Yeah. Well, you know, don't be surprised if it comes alive. That's and really so, amazing, Jordan. That, that, and I, you don't. You don't exaggerate, and that that is no, really no, a, no. that's a stunner. It was a it was a frightening experience to sure. me because I was only twenty six years old, and I'm not expecting that. My eyes were just generally uh, starting from the bottom of the statue and going right, up, right, right, and right. then when I looked up, finally I looked up at the face, and it's staring at me. Well, and divorce it, by statue, right? <laughs> And it scared me. I, my heart dropped in my stomach, and I felt dizzy, and sure. and and fear went all through my body. And all I knew is I got to get my wife and get out of here. And so, I've lived through a lot of that kind of thing. But that was that was just one more experience. That's a good one. Uh, yeah. And did you uh, did I ever tell you about the ghoul that hit our town uh, in Pensacola? Uh, the ghoul? Have, yeah, a ghoul. G H O U L. No, yeah, no, no. I like ghoul stories. Oh, yeah. Well, this is one because uh, when I was about 16, 17 years old, Pensacola in Florida, uh, and you could go on the web and just type in Pensacola ghoul, mm -hmm. and there's all kinds of uh, articles about it. You know, and, but most of them were just uh, professional articles from newspapers and magazines. But I lived it. I was there, and uh, and so 
what I've read on the web about it was nowhere near what I experienced myself. And uh, so the, we woke up one day and in my hometown. I was about, like I said, 16 uh, years old or more. And uh, uh, we found out that there were some bodies laying on the street where they had been uh, eaten on, not, 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 you know, totally eaten, but eaten on. You could tell Nod. these were dead bodies. They, mm-hmm. These bodies had been buried just recent, and mm-hmm. what, whoever it was was able to lift the big concrete uh, covers for the graves, mm-hmm. very, very huge, heavy concrete covers, mm-hmm. and they, whoever it was was able to lift that concrete covers off and take the body out and, and, and drug it along and, and, and end up in the street somewhere, chewing on it and eating on it, and then left the body laid there. And, the, and so the, it didn't take long for the town to flip out uh, because everybody was talking about these, this uh, ghoul that's, that's uh, robbing graves and eating on the bodies and leaving the bodies. And they were, uh, you know. Did you, did you see these? No, I didn't see them. No, but everybody, you know, it was all in the papers, it was in magazines, and people talking on the radio about it. And being a Navy town, it was a very military town. And so all of a sudden, the military is out every day, every night. Uh, you would see military jeeps and half tracks and, and, uh, and all kinds of uh, wow. you know, military presence. Uh, because the military jumped in to protect the town, and they were looking for this thing too, whatever it was. And so, uh, what my cousin, my girl cousin, uh, we would go over to my aunt's house because they had a big, heavy duty, big house. And my family would go over there for sometimes dinner with my aunt right, and uncle. Right. And so, my cousin, my girl, my girl cousin, <clears throat> her boyfriend was uh, a, a deputy sheriff. And so when he would come over for dinner, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> either going to work or coming from work, uh, he'd come over to the house. And so we have, uh, you know, we could sit and talk with the deputy sheriff about what's going on. And he was telling us all kinds of strange stuff that the, uh, that the sheriff and the police were finding and that the military were finding. And uh, tell, tell you uh, mean wait 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 what other kinds of strange things? Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was, he was open. He was opening up his knowledge of the local X Files to you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and but he wasn't. He didn't tell us a whole lot. But he, you know, but we knew from hearing all the reports during the day and the radio and the newspapers and then talking to him and he was telling us, no, this is legitimate. We don't huh. know what this thing is, but we're, it's not human because, uh-huh. he, you know, humans don't do this kind of thing. And so uh, uh, supposedly they, they um, the, the military or the police or whoever it was set a trap for that, that creature. The ghoul. And uh, and they and they put a fake. No, they didn't put a fake, but they but they faked the story, uh, saying that uh, the, they said my, my my you know my cousin's boyfriend said that what they decided to do, what law enforcement decided to do, was to wait until someone passes away again, and when they do, they're going to be buried at. Whitmire Cemetery, and, and we've already the city's already set this up. Mm-hmm. So and so they will put it into the paper immediately. A new person that has passed away, and then it will that person will be buried <clears throat> at Whitmire Cemetery, and so that's to alert this this animal this this creature uh, to where his next uh, his next victim will be. And he said, so they, they've already set this up. They've got lights uh, ready. This was military? They, yeah, this was, the, this was the military, the, the Navy, uh-huh. uh, and, so, and, and also the police. What year would this have been, Jordan, this approximately? This probably about 56, 57, okay. something like that. Right. And um, 
And so, you know, we, we were, my dad and I and my uncle wanted to go out there to the cemetery to see what was going on. And my, and my, and, and, and now uh, my, my cousin's boyfriend said, that's not very wise. You can do it, but if you do it, you better go in the back way and don't go inside the cemetery because that place is, is crawling with, uh, with you know, people waiting for something to happen. And there are sharpshooters there. And the place is really, got light. this is a yeah, big deal all, then. Light. So, uh, so we, we heard again that he had, uh, whatever this creature was, he had struck again. And uh, and and I guess they they were firing at him, shooting at him, uh, and and it didn't hurt him because my co- my girlfriend's my my girl uh, cousin's boyfriend said uh, they we shot him so many times. Military did, Navy did, the sheriff's people, the cops uh, uh. Uh, shot this creature many many times. We hit him, didn't seem to bother him at all. He ran and was able to. Go over the fence. How did they describe? How did this guy talking to you describe what the ghoul looked like? Well, it, it, they said it looked like a man. It was built uh-huh. like a man. Right. But it was obviously, uh, you know, if it's a man, it's one that needs to be put away somewhere, and uh, <laughs> and maybe it's not a man. Maybe it's uh, you know something else. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and so, uh, eventually, that happened where they finally, you know, ganged up on it, and it ran, and they set the dogs on it, and but it was the, the thing was able to outdo the dogs and outsmart the dogs. So you and talked to so, one. Excuse me. You talked to the one guy who actually was involved with shooting. Yeah, right. yeah, what, yeah, what, what, uh, he was a, a deputy sheriff. Yeah, and he and said this so, really happened. Right, it really and he happened. He shot at it. Wow. Yep. Well, what did, and, how did he look? What did he say? Was he well, scared? Was he, uh, perplexed? Was he worried? Was well, he, he was perplexed, but, uh, but he's a sheriff's deputy, so, uh, you know, that's for it, him to handle. I mean, that's yeah, what he does yeah, for a yeah. living, you know. So, wow. we'll talk about more of it when, when we come back. Very good. Yeah. All right. Bedtime stories with Jordan Maxwell. More coming up. Great stories tonight. Go ahead, Jordan. Yeah. Uh, back in 2010, I was homeless again, and I had to move out. And I, I, so I got a little small room in the backyard of a, of a, of a, of a, of a bigger house. And it was just a room, but it had everything I needed. And... Uh, <clears throat> And so I, I worked on the place to you know clean it up and repaint it etc and got it really nice and comfortable. Sure. Uh, and and uh, but there was a piece of molding that was uh, uh, floor molding uh, under the sink and uh, it was falling uh, it was falling apart and so I I glued it back in uh, put some glue on it and glued it back in so. And then uh, a few days later, it's it's laying on the floor again. So then I I I, I put double amount of glue, the the wheel hole, that really strong stuff, and and put it on there and tacked a few little uh, nails into it to hold it. And a, and a couple of days later, I came home and there there it is laying on the floor again. Hmm. And so then I. I uh, I went out and got the hammer and nails and I nailed it back in. I mean, four or five nails. I nailed that molding. It's not going to fall anymore. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so, and so I was I was sitting at uh, at my desk and, uh, and and working. And uh, all of a sudden, one night I'm sitting there working, and all of a sudden I hear the loudest crash, like a car. Uh, uh, hit my hit my room like a car ran through, and mm-hmm. it just a loud thunderous crash, hmm. and it scared me to death. And I jumped around to see what uh, what was wrong, and there was the molding on the floor again. <laughs> wow! And, uh, yeah, and, and and you know I had put a bunch of nails in to make uh-huh. sure, uh-huh. but no, it was a loud crash, and there was the molding on the floor. Well, the, whoever and, used to live in there obviously didn't want it up there. I guess not, because somebody was saying, you can do whatever you want, son, but this is mm-hmm. not going to be... Did you tell the owner about that? 
Uh, yeah, I did, but there's nothing she could do. Did she and, believe uh, you? Huh? No. Did she believe you? Oh, I don't know if she did or not. I just told her what happened. Hmm. But, uh, you know, but the, it doesn't mean anything. That and two bucks will get you a cup of coffee. But, uh, I, you know, I, I know that there was a message in that because the, the sound was so loud. It was absolutely uh, thunderous. And so it made the point. Somebody is saying, no, you're not going to put this molding up. I don't care how you do it. And the other thing uh, I was going to bring up. I remember when to, you were living in that place, come to think of it. You used yeah, to call me from there. I don't think right. you told me about that, though. Oh, maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. I don't recall. But uh, but that that did scare me. because You used to uh, call me from every one of your places. <laughs> Jordan's yeah. moved around a lot. <laughs> Well, yeah, I have to when, when you're homeless. When you're poor, you don't have any, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. When you're poor and you're homeless, you got to move. You got to keep moving. That's right. That's right. And then I would get a place. Somebody would give me a room to let me live in a in a room with their house, and then the house would sell. Yeah. So they have to move. That means I got to move again. I have to call around to my friends and try and find another room, and then I get there for six months or five or six months. And then they uh, they decided they're going to leave and go someplace else, so I've got to leave too. And so that's the way life has been for me. Since 1988, mm. 89, mm. I have been totally homeless. And uh, and so I don't care anymore. I just do the best I can. Well, the, the universe has ultimately taken care of you, though, because you're not on the streets, and you, you have had a lot of very nice people. That's right. Bring you no in about and, it. and uh, provide uh, basics for you. And, and I mean, I, you're a treasure, and I, I just can't imagine why this has been your, your lot in life. It's not right, but uh, well, it has, and, and you've survived it. So, Yeah, I, I, I've i been sued and, and oh, lied I don't, to. I don't even go there. All certain. kinds of stuff that uh, my life has been stolen from me, and all kinds of things have happened to me, but... Uh, but my feeling is I've been put here to do something, and that's what I, you know, like the Apostle Paul quoted in the New Testament. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, am I only to take what is good from God, or am I also to take whatever he gives me? Mm-hmm. So mm. it may be good, it may be bad, but it's still God is giving it to you, so don't complain. And, you you know, never really have complained. No, not to me. I mean, we've discussed these things at great length, but you've never yeah. complained. You've carried this load uh, remarkably gracefully. And, well, I, uh, you know, I, because I just feel that, that it's something I'm supposed to do, and, and that's who I am. That's the life I chose, or that's the life that's been given to me. So there's no use in complaining about it. I yeah, am who I go. am, and I've done what I've done. So. Yeah. Well, at least you got the ears fixed. Come on. Yeah, so, but uh, I, I was going to tell you a little bit. I guess we got a few minutes. I, I'll tell you. Oh, about yeah, we got about uh, 15 uh, minutes. Yeah, well, uh, I think that would be enough, hopefully. Uh, we'll make it 16, my, then. How's that? Well, uh, it's about my, uh, my uh, uh, experiences with uh, David Icke. <clears throat> Back in 1992, I, I, I got a job with a, a publishing house in, in uh, San Diego called uh-huh. Truthseek. Yep. And I was pretty much like an ideologue. I was, I was kind of like in charge of the whole place. There was a lady who was running it, but she let me pretty much run the place the way I wanted to. Right. And, and, she, and the company was a for-profit publishing house, but they had like $24 million in the bank and a, and a public trust fund uh, so that they, they would get the, uh, you know, the uh, interest uh, divided into 12 equal payments. And so that no matter if they made money or they didn't make any money, it doesn't matter because they're getting almost $100,000 a month uh, you know, to to make sure that the company would always have plenty of money to do what it wanted. Sure. And so and so, I got a, a job there as a as a religion editor for the magazines and for the company, 
And then I also ended up being kind of like a, an ideologue. They, they pretty much let me do whatever I wanted to do. And so I was financing everybody. I was giving money to all kinds of writers and, and researchers and, and promoting people on radio and television. And I was having a great time being generous with everybody and helping all my friends. Well, you used to call me when you were down there, too. I remember all this. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and so one day uh, a young girl came in to visit. She called me and, and said she wanted to talk to me. Mm -hmm. uh, she was from England, and she needed to talk to me. So I said, okay, so come over. And she did, and she brought a young man with her. Uh, her name was Alice Ferguson, and, uh, and the guy's name was uh, uh, David Griffin. I think it was David Griffin. And so she's telling me that uh, her friends in, in the U.K. told her to come to America and go to San Diego and meet Jordan Maxwell because he seems to have a, a line on money. And he's being very generous with everybody and helping to mm -hmm. finance people's careers and mm -hmm. get them, uh, you know, uh, get their books published and everything. And so she said, and so that's why I'm here. Uh, and she said, I come here because I wanted you to help me. Uh, promote my friend David Ike, and I didn't know. I didn't know who he was. I have no idea. So I mm -hmm. said, "Well, who is this David Ike, and why? You know, what do we need to?" What year was this again? Ninety nine. No, no, it was about ninety two. No. Had to be. Had to be way early. Yeah, I got. The, I heard you wrong. Okay. Yeah, it was about but nineteen ninety two. I think it was. Mm -hmm. And so I said, "All right." Uh, and so we talked, and then she showed me a VHS uh, of a little ten-minute lecture that David had done in England at some little group. And I liked him. I liked his style. I thought he was very uh, intelligent. And so I said to her, "All right, I will help you with him." And I said, "Here's what I will do. I will give you and your friend uh, uh, David. I will give both of you." Um, um, a job. I will hire both of you to work for me, and I'll give you twenty five hundred dollars. Uh, uh, you know, twenty five hundred uh, a month, two thousand five hundred a month. That's five grand between the two of you. I'll give you a job, and you work for me, doing promotions and doing what I need done, because I was going to hire somebody anyway. So I'll hire you, and you, now you've got a job. And, and I will give you uh, the, uh, the credit card on the foundation. The, the, uh, you know, the foundation has a lot of money, and I'll give you the credit card so that you can promote David Icke and, and, every, every, you know, and everything else I want you to do. You use the, great, the, the, the credit card, and so now you've got a job. Well, that means also, I, I told her, well, that means tomorrow I'm going to have to find you an office here in the building. And of course, with the office, I got to get your computers and phones and printers and all of that stuff. So that's going to be another expense. And so I'll get you an office. You'll both have a, an office to yourself, and I'll outfit the office for you. And and uh, and and then of course you'll you. And so I asked her, "Where are you going to stay?" And she said, "Well, we don't have a place right now." So I said, "Oh, okay. Then what I'll do is I'll get both of you a uh, one-bedroom apartment apiece." And we'll pay for it. The foundation will pay for it. So, uh, you know, go out and look and find an apartment. And uh, and so she said, well, we can't go out because we don't have a car. So I said, all right, I'll lease you a new car tomorrow. I'll go with you. I'll lease you a new car. I'll give you some cash. Go out and find the place you want. And, uh, and then come back and I'll get it for you. And then the company will pay for it. Right. So I got him a new car. I give him a job, twenty five hundred dollars a piece each month, mm -hmm. plus their own office and mm -hmm. plus their own, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one bedroom apartments. And then yeah. I said to them, I said, well, "You're going to need furniture and everything." So I give them both three thousand dollars in cash to go out and buy furniture for their apartment. So both of them had three grand to go out and buy stuff, and so. They were very happy. They should be. I, I was financing them and giving them gold credit cards and all of that. And so uh, then I noticed, I noticed after about a month or so that she, Alice Ferguson, was going on long trips. She would fly to uh, Australia 
to uh, and and all, and have David Ike come to Australia to do seminars and then go to uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Canada and and back to Europe again. And so she was really running up uh, the bills on the credit card. But I don't care, uh, you know, as long as she's doing what I want. You know, as long as she's taking care of the business. And so um, and so she was slowly but surely spending a lot of money on promoting David Ike, getting him on radio and TV. And of course, he has to have a car when he gets into some place wherever he's going, and he has to stay in a hotel. He needs money, and so uh, she was giving him uh, whatever he needed. And and it costs money if you're going to set up a seminar, right. because if you got a theater, you know the theater wants insurance oh, yeah. on the theater in case yeah. somebody dies or something. So if you're going to have a lot of people there, you better have insurance on the building. Well, that's you know they, she just puts that on the credit card. So the bottom line is uh, I'm watching uh, the bills as they come in. Uh, she's going to France. She went to uh, Spain, then she flew to England, and then she has a girlfriend. She brought a girlfriend back, <laughs> and, and, and so she brings a girlfriend to meet me, and she said and she really needs a job. So I said, all right, I'll give her a job, but I'm just going to pay her $1,000 a month, but I'll get her a room, um, I'll get her an apartment, uh, a one-bedroom uh, uh, apartment. Right. And, uh, and I said, but, you know, you have to take care of the, of the three of you with the new car because I'm only getting you one new car. And so I gave her the keys to it. Well, the, 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 the second part of the story is, is that the, she was doing fine. She's traveling all over the world with her girlfriend. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, and they're going here and going there and taking trips, and they're going to see David Icke here, and they're going to take David Icke there. And so I'm busy. I'm roaming around the country taking care of business. I'm up in San Francisco. I went to Canada to do some business there. And so I'm. I, and so once a month, uh, there would be a paycheck. You know, when you come into the office, we each one of us had a a, a folder for our our paychecks and for uh-huh. our mail. Right. And so I came in one day after traveling for a couple of weeks. I came at the end of the month. And my paycheck wasn't uh, wasn't there, and so I asked the uh, Nancy, the secretary. I said, "Did you guys get paid?" And, they, and she said, "Oh yeah, everybody got paid." And I said, "No, not everybody. I didn't get paid." And so I didn't say anything. I just walked on into my office. I figured that uh, you know Bonnie's probably forgot about it or whatever, but I don't have time to fool with it. Uh, and so I had to go back out the next day in San Francisco. And so I'm paying for my own uh, airfare, my own hotel, and so I, I didn't I didn't even think about it because I was so busy. Until I came back in town at the end of the uh, end of that month, and I walked into the office and everybody's been paid, but still, I don't have a, a paycheck. So then I said, "Wait a minute, Nancy. I said, what's going on here? Where everybody's been getting a paycheck? Where's mine?" And she said, "Oh no, we fired you two months ago. You've been fired for a couple of months." I said, "What are you talking about?" She said, "No, no, we got rid of you. You're fired." And I said, "What are you talking about?" She said, "I'm telling you, Bonnie fired you." And and I and I asked her, I said, "Why why would Bonnie fire me?" And she said, "Because Alice Ferguson suggested that that uh, that uh, Bonnie fire you and bring David Ike in to take your place because every all the women love David Ike, and so why don't you just fire Jordan Maxwell, get rid of him, and bring David Ike in? So you're yeah. fired. You've been fired for uh, for two months. So now I go home broke." Because I've already I've tapped my credit card out. Yeah, I remember I this very you know, well. And I had no place to go. I have no money, and so I have to call my friends in Los Angeles to see who will give me a room, who will put me up. And Vladimir Tajinsky, my dear friend from uh, from Eastern Europe, mm-hmm. uh, the scientist, Vladimir gave me a room to uh, gave me his room. He lived in one bedroom apartment. He gave me his room. He bought food. He gave me uh, and drive me around, take me around to wherever I needed to go. He saved my life. And so I had a place to live until I could get back on my feet. But the, but the bottom line on the story is that all that I gave Alice Ferguson, all that I gave them with money, 
for for, for yes. uh, apartments and and new cars, and that's what I got for it. Alice Ferguson stabbed me in the back and got me fired, so I'm I'm sleeping on the floor in Los Angeles with nothing for being so generous for her. So I, you know, I've no good deed kind of goes unpunished, Jordan. I have had this kind of stuff happening to me continually, mm-hmm. over and over and over mm-hmm. again. And, 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 of course, I got a lot of people say to me, well, it's probably something you're doing. And I said, yes, it is. I'm trusting. Yeah, you're being I'm too damn Jesus kind. Man. That's, that was, that's always been the issue. And I want to try and help people, yeah. and I'm always ready to, to give and to be generous. Yeah, I have a character flaw, and that's why I sleep on the floor broke with nothing. Because the people see in me a way to make a lot of money and rip the old man off and get rid of him and take the money. And so that's what I have put up with for all these many years. And so, but I have always known that there must be a reason why these things happen to me. And I know what it is. I, I'm totally sure I know what it is. I have cosmic companions. I've come here to do something of importance, mm-hmm. and somebody knows that I'm here, and they know what I'm doing, and they have the ability to to throw me under the bus. And I'm talking about spiritual entities. I know that I have spiritual en- uh, enemies. Too many things have happened oh, to me. Oh, they're black, black, yeah. black beings so there that'll get in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I know that, that some something evil is watching me yeah. and it is not impressed with what I do and wants me off the earth to destroy my reputation, to destroy oh. my work. Oh, yeah. And uh, so I feel, well, I've been... They're the enemies know, of light and knowledge yeah. and wisdom. Oh, my God, what you've contributed is, is enormous. And well, naturally you would draw the dark side, which wants to rub that out. They don't want oh, people to know the truth. They don't want people to know how it's all run, who set it up. They don't they don't want people to know that they're victims. And the people generally speaking, they don't want to know either. They don't no, care about it. It's just, and now more more or less than ever they just have no interest. No, just bumbling not along. All. Not all, but most of them are just bumbling along like things and yep. they call it flotsam and jetsam. They're just floating along, banging into the shore, banging into each other. There's no purpose. They're not fit for purpose, as uh, Tim exactly Refat right. would say. They just aren't. I always try, and I've, I've said to so many people over the t- over the time that, you know, I'm not here talking to you because I happen by chance to have been born. Most people are here because they just happen by chance to have been born. No, I am here as a teacher. I've come here and spent 60 years of my life preparing myself to be who I am in this particular time in which we are now living, in which the world is now caught up in demonic darkness, evil, treachery, and people of the world do not know how this stuff works and where it's come from and where it's going. So that's what I'm here to do. And no one does it like you, Jordan. Nobody. Nobody. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's not fun to do, and I do remember it quite clearly. I remember well, Vladimir you. and all that. You, you have, you have surmounted things that very few people could could handle, and uh, you sound wonderful as always. Well, I did it because there are people like you who helped me, and I appreciate it. Jordan, you go get some rest, and uh, we'll talk next time. Thank okay. you. Thank you, my friend. Bye-bye. Good night. Jordan Maxwell. There's only one Jordan Maxwell. Okay, we'll be back in 21 hours. Let's see what is tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow night, looks like, uh, oh, good lineup. I'll keep it a secret. Talk to you tomorrow night. Thanks for being here, and thanks for all the kind words in our second hour tonight. I won't forget them. Talk soon.